Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters, with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk, the first challenge to Indiana's same-sex marriage ban heads to court. We can go other places and get married where it, equal marriage is recognized. And that would give us federal protection. But then we come back to Indiana where as far as the state is concerned, we're strangers. What's at stake and how this first case could affect the outcome of the other five challenges to the state's marriage statute. Transferring elderly people from nursing homes to hospitals costs billions of dollars each year and negatively affects patients. A lot of the discussion about why transfers happen from the perspective of federal policymakers is that the financial incentives are misaligned and encourage facilities to send residents out. Ahead, we break down the problem and explain how the federal government is working with health care leaders in Indiana on potential changes that favor treating people in nursing homes. Plus, in our state impact segment, new data shows nearly all of Indiana teachers are effective but can the data be trusted? Those stories and a look at this week's headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Rennan. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. Indiana must recognize the marriage of one same-sex couple. That's the order a federal court judge gave yesterday. The two women asked the court for an emergency recognition of their marriage because one of them has ovarian cancer and doctors don't know how much longer she'll live. The ruling doesn't mean much in a practical sense for other same-sex couples because it only applies to the one couple. But the women are part of a larger lawsuit challenging the state's marriage laws, and it could indicate how the judge is likely to rule in those cases. Josh and Lynn talked to some of the other women involved in that case, and as she reports, they're still in limbo. Want to be interviewed? Yep. Ray Baskin and Esther Fuller met as business partners 24 years ago. Baskin lived in Manhattan, and Fuller lived in Indianapolis. After a long-distance courtship, they decided they wanted to live in the same city. Baskin relocated to Indiana, and she and Fuller moved in together. Go ahead. Fast forward 24 years. Baskin and Fuller have joined four other couples in a lawsuit filed by LGBT civil rights organization Lambda Legal against Indiana's marriage statute. Unlike many other same-sex partners, the two have not considered getting married in another state. I took my taxes in to the guy who does them for me today because those forms make me crazy. And I said, hopefully by this time next year I'll be married. And he said, you know it's going to be a mess. Because I don't even know how to do it. Because you have to do it one way for the federal and another way for the state. Indiana already had a fight this year over HJR 3, a bill that would have added the state's same-sex marriage ban to the Constitution. Lawmakers changed the language of the proposal, so the earliest it could go to the voters now is 2016. Before the dust had even settled, though, the first lawsuit challenging the state's existing law had been filed. By the end of the legislative session, four more lawsuits piled on. We are preparing to um, move forward with arguments um, on behalf of all same-sex couples um, within the state of Indiana to fully and finally uh, rule Indiana's ban against marriage unconstitutional. Ken Falk is the director of the ACLU in Indiana. His group filed one of the suits on behalf of 15 couples. He says the legal challenges come at a time when public and judicial opinions are changing. Supreme Court in Windsor uh, seemed to uh, intimate fairly strongly that targeted laws on uh, same-sex couples would not withstand even the lowest level of scrutiny under equal protection because of the importance of marriage in, in, in society and in life. And I think that has uh, emboldened advocates around the country to attack individual states' laws, which is why you're seeing this done all over now. Indiana Attorney General Greg Zeller is defending the state's law. His spokesman says it's their policy to not comment on pending litigation, but in a statement, Zeller says, 
As Indiana's Attorney General, I will represent our state and defend our statute now and on any appeal to the best of my skill and ability, as I swore an oath to do. As state government's lawyer, I must defend the state's authority to define marriage at the state level within Indiana's borders. Conservative organizations American Family Association of Indiana and Advance in America did not respond when reached for comment. Meanwhile, Ray Baskin expressed hope that the situation may be different this time next year. It's not fair. It's not right. I should be able to say to the whole entire world, this is my wife whom I absolutely adore. Baskin and Fuller's lawsuit is just one of five lawsuits that have been filed against the state. They've all been assigned to the judge who handed down yesterday's ruling. To talk to us more about these cases, we're joined by Deborah Whitus. She's an associate professor at the Indiana University Maurer School of Law. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for inviting me. To start off, this is more ha happening just here in Indiana. There's also a bigger national picture. Can you talk a little bit about that? So um, obviously this issue has been brewing for years and years now, but really when the Supreme Court decided last summer a decision that struck down the federal ban on recognizing same-sex marriage has set off a new wave, and we've seen challenges bubbling up just in almost all the states now that don't permit same-sex couples to get married. Now in these, uh, law there are more than one lawsuits as we saw in the right. piece. Will the judge rule on each one individually? I believe that they've been consolidated, so I would expect that there'll be one ruling, but I'm not sure on that. What, what does this ruling say in terms of Indiana's uh, law on uh, gay marriage? Is well, there a bigger you know, picture here in the state? Well, it's a preliminary yeah. ruling about this one couple because of the dire situation of the health of one of the women. Um, there needs, the judge needs to determine that there's at least some chance that they will succeed, but really he's balancing that against the harm to this couple of not having the marriage recognized, and because of her health condition, that harm could be quite significant. Now, let's just say that the judge does say that Indiana's law is unconstitutional. Then what happens? Will people automatically be able to go down to the courthouse and, and get married? Well, most likely what will happen is what's called a stay, which kind of puts it on pause while the state decides whether or not to appeal, and I would expect it would be likely to appeal, and then the appeal progresses. Well, and, and there is that confusion at times. It seems like where a judge in some state does issue. Right, Utah or Michigan. And then everyone goes to get married, and then there's that hold. Is, is there any advice for those same-sex couples when, when something breaks to well, you know, kind of limit that confusion? Well, you know, certainly if a couple has been waiting, you mm -hmm. know, I understand the impulse to go out and get married, and it can't hurt. Um, it just may or may not be recognized in Indiana as an appeal progresses. A lot of people are saying that it doesn't matter, all this is going to end up with the U.S. Supreme Court. What do you think? I think it is likely that it's going to end up with the U.S. Supreme Court. What I do think matters is that what we see is judges across the country looking and weighing these arguments and just with remarkable consistency holding that there's not a good enough reason to um, deny same-sex couples the right to get married. And these are all smart judges too, weighing the same evidence that the Supreme Court will. So in that sense, I think it matters. We've been following this for quite a while here as well, and we saw the demonstrations by Freedom Indiana and then those in support of marriage in Indiana. Do all those demonstrations, do they have anything, do they have any type of effect on what the judges uh, decide? You know, as a sort of formal matter of legal doctrine, no, but I do think it matters that we've seen a real sea change across the country and certainly here in Indiana on the amount of support that we see for same-sex marriage rights. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank Appreciate you for asking your insight. Me. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dierkman, who has an update on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. Tuesday marked Equal Pay Day, the point in the year where a woman's salary catches up with the man's from the previous calendar year. Nationally, a woman earns 77 cents for every dollar a man makes, but in Indiana, the wage gap is even larger. A woman earns 73 cents for every dollar a man earns. Indiana Democrats say the state needs to do more to close the gap, but others say stricter laws would be bad for business. We know that um, all too often women are head of household and the primary wage earner in their homes, and they just can't make ends meet, and it's not fair. It's not good for families, and it's not good for taxpayers either. I think it, it would create more opportunities for lawsuits and for employers to be sued by employees. I think it'll be great for the trial lawyers, but uh, not so great for the job creators. Indiana Democrats plan to bring the issue up again next legislative session, even though Republicans have blocked previous proposals. 
A Pew Charitable Trust report shows Indiana has improved its election performance, but still lags behind other states. Indiana ranked 30th on overall election performance for 2012. The study shows Indiana's biggest improvements include allowing online voter registration, shrinking wait times and decreasing the number of ballots that were sent to voters overseas but weren't returned. One of the improvements the study suggests is that the state conducts a post-election audit to assess the performance of voting equipment. Indiana University is boosting its minimum wage to $8.25 per hour effective July 1st. The increase will put IU above the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour, which is also the university's current pay floor. The move will cost around $1 million and will affect about 8,700 employees. About two-thirds of those are on the Bloomington campus, and many are in dining and housing services. The state is restarting negotiations with a fertilizer company after the state expressed concerns about the company's ties to terrorist activity. Midwest Fertilizer Corporation is planning to build a multi-billion dollar plant in Posey County. But last year, Governor Mike Pence withdrew state economic incentives when the Department of Defense officials complained that Fatima Group, a Pakistani company with an, owner, with an ownership stake in Midwest Fertilizer, hadn't cooperated with efforts to reduce their threat of their products being used for improvised explosive devices or IEDs. Now the governor says the company has created a new, less explosive fertilizer. A chemical company is opening a solar farm on a former Superfund site in Indianapolis. South Korean company Hanwha constructed the solar farm. Vertelis Specialties owns the land and Indianapolis Power and Light provided a grant for the solar panels installation. Vertelis Specialties officials say it's the first utility sized solar farm to be constructed on a Superfund site. The 43 acres used to be a railroad tie coating facility and, and was abandoned for more than three decades because of contamination. For Indianapolis, it's just uh, an example of how uh, government agencies and private industry can come together in cooperation to do something that's good for the environment and for the, uh, for the local community. The solar farm is expected to generate enough electricity to power more than 1,800 homes each year. A new law mandates that certain tax districts that were created before 1994 be eliminated in the next 10 years. That's worrying some local officials who say the districts are key to improving their cities. We've had $220 million investment in our downtown area in the last seven or eight years. And probably 90% of that wouldn't have, would not have happened without a TIF district which means we can take revenues that these new facilities generate via property taxes and reinvest into the, that area, the designated area. Mayor Bennett says there's still a lot of projects the city would like to accomplish, but it will now have to either postpone them or look for other financing. Indiana University is selling its research center in Indianapolis and moving it to the former Wishard Hospital on IUPUI's campus. The Research and Technology Corporation moved into this former furniture warehouse on 10th Street in Indianapolis in 2003. The university is investing $100 million to renovate the former Wishard Hospital site. The location will bring faculty, students, and staff closer. So we think it provides a, a real unique opportunity for us to work really ever more closely with a key constituent group, namely our faculty, our researchers, and students uh, that we haven't had at our location on 10th Street. Last year, the corporation helped faculty secure 35 patents and launch 16 startup companies. Stefan says the new location will help increase those numbers even more. The renovations are expected to take, to take between a year and a year and a half to complete. Panhandlers in Indianapolis will be able to keep asking for money on the sidewalks as long as they stay out of the streets. The ACLU filed a lawsuit against the city of Indianapolis last year on behalf of a group of panhandlers who were ticketed for asking for money downtown. The ACLU argued the First Amendment protects people's right to ask for money. The compromise prohibits panhandling in streets or next to people's cars, but allows people to ask for money on sidewalks as long as solicitors don't block walkways. School administrators at Fairview Elementary in Bloomington are hoping they've found a new solution to low standardized test scores. Gretchen Frazee has more. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun. School's out for the day and students sit in the Fairview Elementary Library reading with their parents and tutors from Indiana University. Fifth grader Elizabeth Huffman likes to read, but her mom says she could use some more help with reading comprehension. 
I really hope she not necessarily has a newfound love of reading, but is able to delve into it a little bit more as I saw her do today. For the past two years, fewer than half of Fairview students have passed the statewide I-STEP exam. These tutoring sessions are part of the school's latest efforts to improve those test scores. They had 20% of the school that was having this issue. Halfway through this school year, officials moved students to different classrooms based on academic ability. That sparked an outcry, and after meeting with parents, the school reversed its decision. Principal Tammy Miller says the new reading program does a lot to include parents. They're asked to come in and learn how they can work with their child at home, and it's more of a community effort. I heard a presentation from the superintendent in Fort Wayne and she did mention that schools with very similar demographics to Fairview, they had used the same type of approach of bringing the community in and had great success. The program will continue through the end of the school year and administrators say they will then decide whether to pick it up again in the fall. And Joe, officials say that if the reading program works, they would consider expanding it to other schools in the district. Sounds like a good program. Thanks, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk, a new program aims to reduce the number of unnecessary hospitalizations. Why doctors say it's sometimes better if patients are treated in nursing homes. And State Impact has the latest on standardized testing and teacher evaluations. Those stories right here on Indiana News Desk. I can change the world with my own two get a better play with my own two hands. I'm going to make it a brighter place with my own two hands. I'm going to help the human race with my own two hands. I can hold you in my own two hands. And I can comfort you with my own two hands. With my own, with my own two hands. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. If you have an elderly loved one who lives in a nursing home, it's a situation you've probably experienced. Your loved one gets sick and he's transported to a hospital for a few days for treatment and then brought back to the nursing home. Data shows in nearly half of these cases, the elderly person could be treated in the nursing home and wouldn't have to go to the hospital. As Sarah Whitmire reports, these unnecessary hospitalizations cost billions of dollars each year and negatively impact patients' health. As Terry McClinton makes her rounds at North Capitol Nursing Home, she's looking for any changes in people's conditions, even if it seems minor. Her mentality is if she can catch a problem early, she can work to treat it and keep a resident from being transferred to the hospital. A lot of things that, that they do there at the hospital can be done here. I've had a case uh, where a resident um, did have uh, elevated labs and uh, awesome. we did sit down and we called the doctor and you know we convinced him to just give a few days of IV fluid treatments and she she felt better in a few days. If someone is acutely ill then McClinton will call the person's doctor and in those cases the resident would likely be transferred to a hospital. This is a new approach. It's actually part of a pilot program called Optimistic to see if this type of proactive caregiving, looking for condition changes early, can make a difference in the number of unnecessary hospitalizations. Optimistic, our intervention is designed to put these extra resources in nursing homes, see what kind of a difference that we can make in providing that enhanced care. Geriatric patients who are hospitalized are at risk for all kinds of bad things. Risk of falls, you know, these are complicated patients, so lots of providers involved, risk of medication, errors. When they come back to the facility, there's an almost certainty that they will have a reduced level of functioning, less strength, they haven't been walking around as much, and need, and need you know, rehabilitation services. 
The Centers for Medicaid Service is partnering with 145 nursing facilities in seven states to implement the trial program. Nineteen of those nursing homes are in Indiana. Each Indiana facility gets a registered nurse like McClinton, and there's a shared pool of nurse practitioners who visit the facilities and help fill in the gaps. The 19 facilities that we have partnered with in this initiative um, were already working on reducing avoidable hospitalizations. And that's important because uh, it's, it's a big deal for them to accept an outside person coming in and jumping into their team and talking to them about how could we do things differently? Should we try this? Should we try you know, this new tool? The push of the industry to decrease hospitalizations, we certainly wanted to be on the front end of um, innovation, frankly, on how we can get on board with that. The Affordable Care Act mandates nursing homes develop plans to improve health care quality and reduce Medicare and Medicaid costs. And reducing avoidable hospitalizations absolutely figures into that. Figures from 2011 show unnecessary hospitalizations each year among Medicare and Medicaid patients cost between $7 and $8 billion. The reason these avoidable hospitalizations cost so much is complicated. So the easiest way to visualize this is possibly to look at these umbrellas. So let's think of the pink umbrella as Medicaid. So we'll label this one Medicaid. And then we'll label the orange one Medicare. Most long-term nursing home residents fall under this Medicaid umbrella, but let's say they get transferred to the hospital. Then this Medicare benefit kicks in. And if they're in the hospital for three or more days and then they return home to the nursing home care facility, something called the Medicare post-acute benefit kicks in. And that reimburses at a much higher rate because the reasoning is that people who've been hospitalized probably require more care. They might require therapy, something like that. So a nursing home all of a sudden is getting reimbursed from this Medicare fund and this Medicaid pot. So if you've heard about nursing homes getting reimbursed twice or double dipping, that's what people are talking about. A lot of the discussion about why transfers happen um, from, the, from the perspective of federal policymakers is that the financial incentives are misaligned and encourage facilities to send residents out and that the federal government is going to change these incentives in some way to try to favor treating people in nursing homes. Unroe says the big question is whether nursing homes have the resources to provide that extra care, even if they want to. That, of course, is what the pilot project does. If it's successful, Unroe says part of what the government might do when it restructures the financial incentives is look at adding additional resources in nursing homes on a permanent basis. The grant for the project runs for four years. It's been about a year and a half, and while everyone we talked to said it was too early to, de to determine whether it was a success, Torrin Jackson says at her facility, there's been a notable decline in unnecessary hospitalizations. The State Board of Education met this week to discuss standardized testing and teacher evaluations. State Impact Education reporter Ellie Moxley joins us now to give us more insight into what happened this week. Ellie, first of all, there was a chance that students were going to have to take two standardized tests. Yes, there was. Uh, Indiana students will now only have to take one standardized test this spring after all. The State Board of Education agreed Wednesday to drop a plan to administer a second test next month after schools give ISTEP. The second test, called CoreLink, would have included new types of standardized test questions likely to appear on future exams. But the platform required to run CoreLink will not run on iPads, which many schools use for online testing. And some state board members question the need to administer the test at all because Indiana is moving away from nationally crafted academic standards known as the Common Core. And they haven't decided yet what the new standards will look like. So the argument is you can't test kids on something if you don't know exactly what they are going to be taught. It's still possible state education officials could require schools to administer CoreLink in the fall. That would mean three tests for Indiana students next year. Right now, kids are scheduled to take two tests to comply with state and federal accountability rules. The other big story of the week in education, the first set of state-mandated teacher evaluations were released. 
We've got a full list broken down by school on our website, and if you click through, you can see the vast majority of the 55,000 teachers, counselors, and administrators that were evaluated received effective or highly effective ratings. But some education officials and policymakers say too many educators were placed in those top two categories, and that shows the system needs an overhaul. Right now, teachers are only eligible for raises if they get an effective or highly effective rating. So the state superintendent says they might need to re-examine that policy. And Ellie, you said about 55,000 educators got evaluated. Is that everyone in the state? Actually, no. About a quarter of Indiana schools did not have to report teacher ratings to the state this year. And that's because they signed longer contracts with their unions before the new law took effect in 2011. Mm, interesting. Thank you very much, Ellie, for that report. Thank you. The Milton-Madison Bridge on the Kentucky-Indiana border is now the longest bridge in North America to be slid laterally into place. Take a look at this time-lapse video. Crews built the new bridge and put them on temporary steel stands. They then slid sections of the bridge onto the permanent concrete base. Crews had to stop once because of high winds over the Ohio River, but they finished with little issue the next day. That's all the time that we have on this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Communications, serving southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters, with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. And by WTIU members, thank you.